Um, hello everybody, so my name is uh, Francis Scholl, okay, so I'm from French background, I'm also American today, I've been living in the US for 16 years, and I developed a model, the intuitive compass I will share with you today. Uh, it's the sum of many experiences from straightforward business when I was a business owner and managing director of a publishing house in Paris, to moving to theater, um, producing plays, directing, as much as performing as a, um, a classical singer, a baritone. Um, so I've been on both sides of the stage and I also studied clinical psychology in relationship to voice and the importance of uh, listening in the ear in the development of the psyche uh, in human beings. And um, what else? And I've also been very interested in uh, ancient traditions from Hinduism to Native American uh, cosmology. So all of this to tell you that this model um, has helped actually organization with innovation, creativity, and, um, and even reinvention of business models. So very, very briefly, just to show you the result, because it's an unusual model, okay? So it's not so much to brag about my work, but much more to tell you the sense of wonder that I experience when I see things shift in organizations. So innovation, I've worked um, a lot with L'Oreal, the um, cosmetic organization, the cosmetic company, uh, with the R&D teams, okay? And I've developed seminars to actually help managers work with scientists, okay? And I've had scientists who are also um, chemists uh, leading teams and having to manage the creativity of their teams. And just to let you know, when they come to my seminars, usually at the end of day one, they're like, okay, am I dropping this or am I staying? And at the end, usually what they say, well, actually, not only I found solutions to problems I was looking for, but much more, I found a way to solve problems that will come in the future. So, you know, it's like, helping them to fish rather than giving them fish. So the second thing is creativity. I've worked in the uh, fragrance industry with perfumers. Perfumers are scientists. They work with a vocabulary that's about 4,000 uh, molecules in their head. At the same time, they are poets and artists. And I've helped an organization rethink the way they were working together. And again, we saw amazing results from a rather depressed team of perfumers. We moved into actually the most winning um, uh, fragrance uh, perfumers team in terms of awards in the industry. And we've even seen brands hiring two perfumers from the same house on the, uh, the biggest fragrance development of the year. They were finalists from the same fragrance house, which is unheard of, that was new. And then finally, which I think is interesting for you, it's um, a recent experience I've had in the media industry where it was about rethinking the business model and rethinking the organization supporting the business model in a pretty uh, hierarchical, um, linear, high-level reporting, uh, very political uh, culture. And in 2009, they were suffering a lot from the recession and a lot from the transition of the media, paper magazines to electronic word and world. And um, the CEO at the time wanted to really sell the whole division and really believe that they would never be profitable again. And in 2010, they're going to be ending up in, in the black. They're, they're, they are back to profit. So all of this to say that there are results in the business uh, conventional sense, but there are also results in the more creative, scientific um, production um, of creative ideas. All right, let's move on. So my observation, and we've said this, uh, I've heard this today, that doing things by the book doesn't deliver the results we want. So what I have to say is that usually people think that organizational structures and processes are the key to innovation. Actually, research has proved that innovation is much more a factor of people and culture. Now, the problem with people, and that's the research by McKinsey that was produced in 2008. Now, the problem with people and culture is that people are more rational than they are rational, okay? So let's move on into my observations, which I think are key to understand uh, organization. The first thing is, that's what I just said, neuroscience has proved in 2004, Rochester University in New York, that actually our gray matter works more for non-conscious thought processes than really for conscious thought processes. In other words, you know, we've, we look at our brain as being this instrument that can be consciously monitored and used when actually there's a huge part of our brain, of our gray matter, that's functioning on its own without real conscious relationship with what we think we're doing, okay? So it's key. The second thing is that actually play is much more profound than we think. Play happens in the stem brain, or brain stem, okay? 
brainstem, sorry, meaning it's a, a very archaic part of our development and it's actually going to be key in the evolution of civilization. Okay, there's a, a professor by the name of Dr. Stuart Brown and the National Institute for Play that puts it very eloquently. There's a book and I would encourage you to read it. But play is really the way for us to move beyond the confines of logic and tap into imagination. And the good thing about play is that because it happens at that core level of the brain, it also um, is a way to address the core level of inertia that's a function of instinct as much. All right. So in other words, with our Western uh, analytical approach, we've handicapped ourselves. Uh, I've been trained in what's called, what's supposed to be the best business school in Europe, okay? And the way I've been trained is really to think logically, to deal with process and structure in a way that's rational, result-oriented, and process-based. Actually, it's not the way to deal with organizations that are really in a pit hole and are looking for disruptive creative ideas. That's why I came up with the, the model, the intuitive compass, okay, to address real, deep, change in organizations. All right, so uh, in this compass, you see the North reason, okay, which is pretty much um, the highest form of intelligence according to the school system I went through, okay, according to the conversation I have with people, according to the tests that prevail today. But as I said, no, I don't think I said this, uh, neuroscience um, research by MIT in 2005 has proved that actually in parts of the brain traditionally associated with instinct, okay, the reptilian brain, They've seen that actually that part of the brain is heavily involved when we make um, sophisticated decisions. Simply put, there is intelligence in our guts, okay? So now the thing is, how do you leverage this intelligence? How do you leverage the logic of the brain when actually you're so enmeshed with the logic of the mind, okay? So it's really not about opposing one to the other, but it's about allowing a flowing, creative, productive synergy between reason and instinct. The second thing is, in business, we're very interested in results. Okay, we want to get things done, we want to make our projects uh, come to completion and fruition. Yet, okay, if you're too much focused on results, you will never take in the journey. And you know the Buddhist saying that goes, it's not about the destination, it's about the journey. The journey is important because it's where you discover the new. Okay, and in the new comes, in the new, in newness comes creative ideas. Okay, so again, it's not about opposing one to the other, it's about a creative productive synergy between this linear efficiency that brings results in a traditional sense of work, okay, and efficiency, and at the same time allowing the creative process of play in order to find new ideas. Okay, so now in organization, you know, really seriously, uh, the, 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 um, um, traditional wisdom will have it that reason applied to result, okay, is how you manage business, okay? That's a typical traditional administration approach, okay? Now, the second quarter of the compass, when you apply instinct to results, that's typically your sales uh, posture, okay? You will uh, get them out the door, they come back to the window, they'll do whatever it takes to get to close the deal. In the northwest quadrant, by the way, all of this is available on the internet, I speak it, I spoke it at TED, so it's recorded on my website, and you can also download it if you go to my website. But anyway, it's on YouTube as well, it's pretty much everywhere, thanks to the internet today. <coughs> now, um, if you apply re re reason to a creative process, okay, who are these people in business? Okay, they're your marketers. The marketers, the strategy planners, the analysts, the architect, the designer. But more importantly, what lives in the Southwest Quadrant is the function of instinct applied to play, okay? And this is where actually invention, creation, R&D, and no one single scientist, okay, that will come up with meaningful, deep uh, uh, findings will be able to save himself or herself from that southwest quadrant, okay? Every great scientist will tell you, I was not working, I was playing, um, my idea came in a mysterious manner, okay? So all of this to say that it really eludes the rational mind and it eludes linear efficiency, which doesn't preclude that 30 years of deep, hard work, you know, have been preceding this moment, but the moment of epiphany eludes what processes and logic would have. So, now, um, let me put it this way. You know, in the blue quadrant, I need to know what's in the fridge for tomorrow, okay? I need to have some sense of planning about my life, okay? Then in the yellow quarter, in the northeast, I need to know that what's in the fridge is fresh, okay? I need to manage, in a way. And then in the southeast quarter, of course, I need to produce. So there's something in the fridge, okay? So those three functions are very important in life, okay? 
but they're not essential. Where life unfolds is in the red quadrant. Where life force is, okay, when you change your organization, when you create enthusiasm, when you uh, find the, creative, uh, the creativity, the level of creativity that you need to really disrupt and reinvent lives here. So in a world where complexity and change are the key buzzwords, okay, we need to focus on the southwest. Now, if you're too much focused on the blue, the yellow, and the green, you dry out the red, and you end up on pills, okay? You end up on antidepressants, all right? That's why so many organizations are so lame and so not inspiring, okay? And this, that's, that's why there's so much burnout, okay? And that's why you need to improvise, okay? To come back to some, something that's been said uh, today. So now, let's look at an organization that's pretty serious, doing pretty well, and understands science, okay? Google, all right? These are the meeting rooms, all right? So that's to tap into the imagination of the child, obviously. This is how they access the restaurant. Why do they do this? Okay, because it's physical, they engage people physically, therefore they take them out of the mental control, they bring them to the body, and in the body lives improvisation, reactions, feelings, okay? And of course it's playful as well. Okay, these are chairs, swing chairs, why? Because logic, okay, the best instruments of logic is language, and language appeared when we moved from crawling on the floor to standing so that the, the, the larynx could take its position and allowed us to develop language. So now, if you are vertical, you are in the axis of language. If you are horizontal and swinging, you're no longer in the axis of language, and you're opening up to the, physicality of your, the physical reality of your being. And finally, this is a relaxation room uh, that Google has installed so that people can relax. Why? Because actually, the creative output of any individual is not a linear function of time. Okay? There are still organizations that ask people to come from 9 to 7, although part of their mandate is innovation. And I do tell them, please, forget this. Let them lose. Okay? Let them do and manage their time and their work. Okay? Because if you really want them to be creative, they will need to mobilize a level of energy, a level of commitment that what, no matter what, whether they're on the subway, at home cooking, or at, that's right. or at work, that's why I want it. So I'm that powerful, obviously. So, um, <laughs> So, you know, they will be working for you 24-7, no matter what happens, okay? So let them be. And that's what they do, because they know perfectly that helping them reju rejuvenate or relax will give them more creative and more productive at the end of the day. So, to boost creativity in science, absolutely, yes, we can, okay? I'm convinced that it's possible, yet we need to rethink the way we think, okay? And the way we think is actually not that profound. And as I say, often organizations, in the name of logic, we are simply being very illogical, okay? I mean, great geniuses will tell you that breakthroughs came at places that were, you know, obviously um, not expected to start with, and that accidents led them to this place of breakthrough. Um, okay, the joy of, uh, the joy of PC to Apple, no problem. So, um, uh, Einstein, who's one of, probably one of the greatest uh, genius of the past century, said that the intuitive mind is the sacred gift, the rational mind, its faithful servant. Okay, that's what Einstein said. And he said, we created a society that honors the servant and has forgotten the gift. Okay, so let's understand one thing. To be a human being, as my yoga uh, teacher would say, David Life, you know, the hardest thing is life is probably to get up every morning. Because the level of intensity that goes on in life is huge, okay? From what's going on in wars, people dying, all the drama that we know. It's very hard to stabilize one's psyche in such a level of intensity. We develop cultures and civilizations, okay, and moral codes so that we can all function together. All right, that's good and fine. Now, the thing is, that doesn't take us away from having to stabilize the instable called nature, okay? And if we are able, and we've had the ability, one more minute, for the ability to have the wisdom to understand that culture, civilization, and science are great instruments, but that they, are not, they are not life. They are not, they don't equate to reality. They are just instruments for us to live better with, with, with reality, okay? So we'll just finish on this. The reason why I, I, I created this concept of intuitive intelligence is to actually establish a creative, productive, non-dominant, collaborative relationship with the part of life that we cannot dominate, the part of life that cannot pierce through logic. Okay? And I will just finish with this um, quote uh, by Native Americans Lakota that I know well and improvise music with, who says, it's not about peace on earth, 
but much more about peace with her. And that's really, I think, a profound reshifting of the way we approach life and the way we can approach creativity and science. Thank you.